Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with the Magic Brad Show, and I've got a new friend, and her name is Royce. Is that right, Royce? That is my name, yes. Where, where are you located right now? I am in California, up in the mountains near Lake Arrowhead. I saw that. That's, uh, that's where that arrow, arrow, Arrowhead water comes from, right? I guess it is. They're stealing our water, yes. <laughs> Gravity, you're up in the mountains, it rolls down there. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep, I spent a couple years out there, one year in Covina, Glendora, and one year in North Hollywood, Studio City. Yep. Interesting place to be, but you're I'm up in the actually, mountains. I'm a California native, so I've lived in several places here. It's very rare to find California natives, I'm, I'm told. Well, it's probably, you know, they say that a lot of stuff from California then hits Minnesota later, and uh, Minnesotans have deep roots. They kind of don't leave here either. If they do, they oh, really? come back. Yeah. Huh. I spent 53 years in the same house before I got married. Wow. Other than a couple of years in LA. <laughs> so that's the way we work in the Midwest. We just don't change. Yeah. So you married and got kids and that kind of stuff, or are you single, wild, and crazy? I am married and have an adult kid and two amazing granddaughters, twins. Yes. Oh, that must be fun. Ah, best. Are best. they identical so they look the same and you get to dress Not them at all. Or? Not at all. Not at all. Totally different. Personality? Personality, totally different. Yeah. <laughs> Just born at the same time. Right. Yeah. Well, no, one of them was one minute older and she never lets you forget that. So. Well, that's yeah. a good point. They're not really born at the same time. That could be burdensome. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Good, the good thing they have the arguments after they're already out instead inside. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe they had them in there too. Probably did. <laughs> yeah. How, how long have you been where you're at now? Uh, we've lived here, I guess, four and a half years. Yeah. Okay. And you like it up there in the mountains? I, it's heavenly up here. The only problem is, of course, the snow season and the fire <laughs> season. But other than that, it's great. Yeah, I did some uh, driving truck for a magician illusionist friend of mine. We had to go through the Rocky Mountains, through those passes and stuff. And if it's snowy, you don't go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we take many snow days up here, yes. <laughs> we get snow here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but uh, it's not like it is. It's, it's dangerous up there in the mountains. I know when I, I moved to Asheville, North Carolina for a couple oh, of years, and going through the mountains and stuff. And even with just a dusting of snow, they'd shut down the schools. And I thought, why? It's because a little bit of dust on a curvy mountain road isn't good for a bus full of kids. That's why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you do. I read some of it. It's in the spiritual realm of things. And can you share a little bit about what you do to help people? Because that's what you do. That's what I do. I've been doing it for decades. Yes. Um, it's always hard to explain because it's very experiential and each person is different, but I help people get in touch with some subconscious notions that they've carried with them either from this life or past lives or between lives that are getting in the way of success or feeling deserving or knowing who you really are inside, knowing what your purpose is. Um, I also help people with crisis management um, because I find that, well, right now there's a lot of crises going on, but people always seem to have, you know, personal crisis. And um, I've ended up kind of serendipitously uh, with people in my classes that have all gone through some pretty traumatic events, um, starting back in the 80s where I, I was dealing with some people that had their children abused and in preschool situations. And um, from there, it's just been all kinds of interesting things that I've worked with people on, whether it be addictiveness or being molested or being abandoned or whatever it is. Um, so it really combines the real world workings, you know, getting past some of those blocks and fears and programmed notions, um, as well as you know, how do I live with this? What do I do with this? I'm very pragmatic. I don't just tell people, I'll oh, just meditate and do affirmations and your life will be great. I really give people tools so that they can take that shift and do something with it in the real world. 
So that's, you know, kind of a bottom line explanation of what I do. Yeah, my wife is a, a well, we don't like to use the word coach. She's a shaman, but she helps people, you know, in the spiritual world, in the real world, just a lot of dream work kind of stuff. And I think it's really important that you have someone else outside of you to be able to point things out. And you talked about the, uh, the traumatic stuff. Oftentimes, humans don't see that or feel that because our body is so good at protecting itself and puts up those, those defenses to protect itself. And like back when I was uh, producing events, I was with a business partner. We, we did really good with the business, but he was the kind of guy that wanted a job. I was the kind of guy that wanted a company. I wanted to be able to manage the people instead of be in the job. He, he wanted to be there on site. And we got a lot of this kind of stuff going and you don't notice it at first. And I, we were busy doing a lot of work, a lot of shows and things. And it starts sneaking up on you doing 11 shows and it gets stressful and you don't notice it. And I had a mild stroke. It was just like, they call it a transient ischemic attack. It lasts for about three minutes. But I thought, when, when I went and had my head examined, because <laughs> that's what they had to do, scan my head to find out there was a, something stopped up there. I thought, what? I'm in good shape. What are you talking about? I had a stroke, a mini stroke. A, they call it a transient ischemic attack. I couldn't believe that it was that, but it's accumulative. You're stressed out with all this stuff and it sneaks up on you. And it, mm -hmm. I think you often need someone like yourself or some kind of consultant coach or a third entity to kind of to shake you up a little bit and say, hey, something's happening here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my husband had a stroke too. And I actually wrote a book, uh, an entire book about it um, because there he was, a very healthy, vibrant 57 year old man and, you know, athletic and, you know, conscious, spiritual, all of that. And it just kind of came out of the blue. And it became probably one of my own personal best teachings, teachers because I had to really start applying what I was teaching others about dealing with these traumatic events and how can we deal with it in a spiritual way rather than just freak out and, you know, do all that stuff that we just naturally want to do. So um, I wrote a book about it and it ended up really be a stroke or anything, any kind of traumatic physical or any kind of um, event that really rocks your world. So yeah, it, it's, it was quite an intense time, yes. <laughs> yeah, again, again, that stuff sneaks up on you, don't really realize what it is. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the goldfish is in the goldfish bowl and doesn't know it because that's what they do. So you need someone outside to kind of rattle your cage a little bit and let you know that something else is, is going on. I remember uh, I did some work with a guy that did breath work and we did some you know, deep breathing exercises and you kind of get into a very meditative state and, and uh, my issues was this not enough, you're not enough kind of stuff. And I found out I had some childhood abandonment issues because I had some alcoholic parents that would take off and leave me home by myself as a little kid. And then I would get rewarded when they came back, they'd have a nut goodie candy bar for me. So right. that was my sort of pacifier saying, it's okay if you leave me because you'll be coming back, you'll give me my treat. So when I got done with this breathwork session, I got up and I was just craving chocolate like crazy. And I just had to stop at the, the store to get a nut goodie candy bar and a beeline to the candy place. And there was this big package of nut goodies with six nut goodies in it. And on the way home, I ate about three of them. Because mm. I was so craving that stuff that happened, you know, that, that finally came to the surface. But other than that, I would have never known that stuff was there unless yeah. I was able to get some help from someone else to show it to me. Yeah, yeah. And that's a lot of what I do with people because a lot of, in fact, all of that stuff is subconscious. And um, we kind of go through life and we don't see what we're doing. We're not aware. And once we are aware, or my famous quote that I always tell people, once you know, you can't unknow. Mm -hmm. So once we're aware of what's going on and we see the pattern and we see all of that stuff that we've decided during those you know, traumatic moments, we can shift them. We can start to really be who we are and be authentic and live a deserving life. So yeah, and, and not crave those uh, chocolate bars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's things like things you, you know and things you don't know and things you don't know you don't know. And, exactly. Uh, you do yeah. need someone else to be able to shine the light on it because if you don't know, 
I mean, when I had that stroke situation, I had no idea that, because our business was okay, it was stressful, but I didn't notice it. And then all of a sudden when I had that situation, I thought, you know what, I'm not gonna die in this office. So I resigned, I, I told him I'm done. We're yeah. not gonna do, I'm not gonna do this here. So I sold my share of the business and that's when we moved to Asheville, North Carolina. I did some healing work and got rid of all that stuff. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah. Good for you. You got to, life's too short, even though it's really long. You know, the, the, the big picture of life, the eternal life, it's a long life. It is, <laughs> forever and ever, yes. <laughs> so do you do your work on like primarily Zoom or do you do in-person kind of stuff or do you do group sessions? What type of programs do you have available? Nowadays, it's all online. It's all on Zoom. Yeah, and nowadays. So, yeah, I do individual work and I work with groups. Um, I find that the informational aspect of what I teach people really helps them to start delving inside. So I always recommend that they do you know, I also have an e-course that they can take if they don't want to do it in the group, but I always recommend that they get the information first, which kind of helps, you know, give a direction for what, a, what we're trying to do in the inner work. So if people are interested, it's all on my website, RoyceMorales.com. Um, and I also have written, you know, not only the book about my husband's stroke, but I've written a couple of other books that talk about my teachings. Um, one of them is a fictionalized story about a spiritual teacher who discovers her soulmate and what happens from that and it's not what you think <laughs> it's not walking arm in arm off into the sunset living blissfully ever ever after and um, that one kind of talks a lot about you know why do we feel certain attraction to people and what is that from and it, it's filled with a lot of my spiritual teachings as well but if you're just interested in learning about what I teach, I do have a book that very specifically goes into that. And it's called No, K-N-O-W, A Spiritual Wake-Up Call. And you can get a, a real strong sense of what these teachings are about. It's not as experiential as doing it live, of course, but it's still, you know, it's interesting information. It's powerful information. Well, I think it's important to at least have some kind of live interaction situation, even if it's... Um... If it's a group thing where people can ask questions and then learn from the other questions that are asked and answered, yes, yeah. because you need something. Otherwise, otherwise, if you're just reading the book, you're taking in the information yourself and you're processing the information yourself, and it's it's really not getting outside into that. As I say the third entity. There's got to be something else outside that can look at both points of view. Because when you're just I reading agree. the book yourself, you're kind of doing self-talk thing, and you might be missing something because you're ego is defending you or whatever so you gotta yeah and that's why outside. for the, the the decades i've been teaching it's always been small groups because i know how powerful that is but you know everybody was twisting my arm and saying you've got to write a book so i you know kind of relented and did that but like i said i highly recommend doing the the, the group situation and i do keep it small i keep it intimate so that everybody gets attention and stuff starts to get rattled up inside of you. I'm there and I can help you through it. So yeah, it's definitely empowering. You ever do, seeing you're up in the mountains, you ever do retreats up in the mountains, find a little place and get- food? Um, I used to do retreats all the time, but now, you know, nobody wants to <laughs> go anywhere or do anything, but I, I'm sure eventually I will. I have some old students that keep wanting me to do a retreat. I used to do probably six or eight retreats a year. But like sure. I said, that's kind of stopped right now. But yes, yeah. it has. The breaks have uh, have gone on the event world. That's for sure. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> yes, definitely. That's why I started doing these online things again because I used to go to local meetups and groups and all that kind of stuff. But now you can't get within six feet of anybody. Right. Got to right. stay away. <laughs> so yeah. Yes. It's definitely different. You, it is. You, you said that when you talked about your book, you you did a little air quotes thing about it's a fiction book. Because it's not fictionalized. really a fiction, fictionalized. Kind of, kind of like, the, like the Celestine Prophecy. Remember that book? Yes, I do. I, yeah. I read that um, quite a few years ago. And I, the reason I got it, I just, I wanted to have something that was, uh, someone would see and they would connect with me. That was my agenda for it. I want people to see the book and have someone walk them and go, hey, how are you liking the Celestine Prophecy? <laughs> so I was reading this book and all of a sudden I realized, oh, this isn't about spirituality. This is fiction. Somebody in Peru, all this stuff. <laughs> and then I, I was at the ice cream shop that's next to the church I used to go to. And a guy walks up to me and he goes, 
So what are you thinking of the Celestine prophecy? So there was that connection right there. We right. talked a little bit more about it. And all of a sudden I started realizing that the book wasn't really fiction. It was like, oh, I get it. These insights and their different stages of spirituality. And all of a sudden I had this big aha epiphany. Right. So that must be kind of like what your book is. It's a little shine. Some well, it, I call it fictionalized because I kind of changed the names to protect the innocent. <laughs> uh, but it is definitely a true story about me. And um, it goes into several, you know, past life experiences that I've had, very bizarre spiritual experiences that I had. Um, but I just kind of wanted it to be written more in a story format. Um, but the teachings are definitely true, definitely real. Yeah. You know, what, do you, what do you say to the people that uh, don't believe in that past life stuff? They think that, okay, you die and you went to heaven and it's over, or you die and you rotted and there's nothing left? Because I, I kind of understand that, uh, you know, in a world of eternity, you know, infinite time, stuff has got to come back again and get processed, reprocessed. That there's there's got to be some kind of cellular memory or uh, what maybe you would call it like just energetic that's out there in the ethers that's got to come back. Sure. Yeah. Well, what I say to people, and I have a lot of people that start my my course from that place. And well, first of all, I don't immediately jump into that. I, I kind of, you know, feel the waters out and see where <laughs> people are ready. But I have to tell you, I was one of those people. You know, I was um, an intellect and I studied philosophy and I had every argument in the book when people would say, oh, you know, I believe in reincarnation, I would think, I would say that they were so ridiculous and what a stupid theory. And it's just because you're too afraid about death. So they came up with this theory. I mean, I had all kinds of arguments about it. So I've heard all kinds of arguments from people. And what changed my opinion was personally experiencing remembering a past life and having my life change from that. I had very severe stomach issues and, um, one of the places where I was learning was, it was called the Spiritualist Church. And they were teaching us how to be mediums and clairvoyants and all of that. Um, and one day, one night actually, I was there and I was meditating. And out of the blue, I saw an image of a woman drinking poison. And I literally felt the poison going down my throat and into my stomach and it was burning and it was painful and I was crying. And it, was, it was a full on past life memory experience. And when I opened my eyes, you know, I told the teacher about it and she kind of poo pooed it because they didn't believe in past lives in that organization, which is so bizarre. But from that point on, my stomach issue went away. So it became an in, I became an instant believer from that experience. So I tell, I tell people, gosh, don't believe it because I'm, I'm teaching you about it. Believe it when you experience it and when you really know it in your, in your own experience. So that's what I tell people. Yeah, and even uh, say the situation, uh, like you said that the, the pain went away. Yeah. Isn't that good enough? Even if this other thing is fluffy wuffy, <laughs> the pain <laughs> exactly. is gone, okay? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've had people say, well, how do I know I'm not making it up? I said, well, make it up. doesn't yeah. matter. What matters is what happens from it. You know, if you make up something, it's first of all coming from somewhere. And second of all, if it changes your life, then who cares where it came from? I'm kind of a believer in like the microcosm, macrocosm kind of stuff. The, like, like if you're in a forest and you got a bunch of maple leaves and a bunch of cottonwood tree leaves and a bunch of other stuff that falls and it decomposes into the dirt and minerals and stuff, and then it's going to come back as a tree or something. So there's the reincarnation part. It might not be a cottonwood, might not be a maple tree, it might not be an oak tree, it might be a fir tree, right. but it did come back. It so did. that's kind of the way I look at the whole reincarnation thing, because everything does fall apart and come together. Just like water rains, it evaporates, goes back up into the clouds and it comes back down. It, it does that. Everything does. You inhale, you exhale, you inhale, you exhale. Everything reincarnates. Right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. In my opinion. <laughs> yes. It's fun talking about these kind of things because of my magic background, you know, the whole concept of like, is magic real? Well, depends on what you, what you believe. Like, I lived out in California, spent a couple of years out there, and I went out there with $600 and I stayed out there for two years. 
So how did that happen? That seems like a miracle to me. <laughs> that is. <laughs> so, so you got to kind of look at all these things. How do things really happen? It's kind of fascinating how even trying to figure out how things happen, kind of just let it happen rather than, you know, my wife, like I said, she's a shaman. So she thinks that I think too much and I should quit thinking so much because I know I do. I process stuff in my brain. I start toggle it between my left and my right. And gotta just feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that stuff starts to go away as you, as you experience more in the spiritual realm. And I, at least it did for me because I was exactly the same way. I had to figure everything out and I had to get facts and information. You know, in fact, when I first started delving into my own past lives, I started researching them. You know, I started looking up history to see, oh, wow, could this really be? And now it's like, okay, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> Bring yeah, it on. I, I kind of boiled the whole thing down. I have a little saying that there are only two facts. One, one is I exist, and the other one is there are no other facts other than that. <laughs> it's great. Because yeah, facts can change with circumstances, and they could be made up. But the I am part, I know that I am. I just don't know what form or where or when or how or what. But I know I am just because mm -hmm. of my consciousness and then everything else I don't know about these facts because they're they're all made up out of stuff that's true <laughs> it's a weird way of looking at it that's what happens with this magic stuff because some people oh, yeah. come to me with the magic and did you ever see that guy he could bend spoons it wasn't sleight of hand he is actually bending the spoon and I go well it was probably an illusion because I've seen people do that stuff and they're doing sleight of hand. Now I do believe that the mind is powerful enough to be in harmony with the molecules of the spoon and possibly bend it, but I've never seen anyone do it. But I believe it's it. possible. <laughs> See, there you go. I've done it. <laughs> I actually have, you're, you're bringing back a memory. When I, back when I was being trained to be a channeler, one of the little experiments that we did um, was to bend spoons. And I was like you, I didn't believe it. I, and there I was holding the spoon and it bent. And I couldn't deny that either. It's like, okay, I just did that with my thoughts. All right. You know, and it isn't about bending a spoon. It's about realizing the power of thoughts. And if I can do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a. Quite a few people I interviewed from that new movie, How Thoughts Become Things. It's sort of a spin-off of The Secret and What the Bleep kind of consciousness kind of stuff. And it was fun talking with all those people because I'm a, that's it's on my business card, conceive, believe, achieve. Because that's pretty it, pretty much it. If you can get something inside of your head and start brewing it, and mm -hmm. you actually firmly believe in it, it is going to be what it is. Whether it's, whether it's real, quote, real or not, it is. Um, and I I when, I, when I was out in LA, I was with a friend of mine. We were on Venice Beach. You ever been down there? Oh, yeah. All the belly dancers. And this was early on in my spiritual path, and I'd never been to California before. So you see all these belly dancers and all this music and incense and weird, you know, bizarre stuff going on. We were walking along and talking, and all of a sudden I turned and he was gone. He just disappeared. And I thought, I was freaked out a little bit. But what happened was I was looking this direction, looking that direction, looking this direction. He had just casually walked into a shirt shop to look mm -hmm. at a shirt and I didn't see him. The timing was just right, but I could swear he vanished. <laughs> <laughs> so in my head, that's what I, I believe, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, what was that? War of the Worlds kind of thing. Right. Where you yeah. don't know if it's real or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, what you said, I think, is important, conceive and believe and receive. And I work with people's belief systems, you know, because that's what stops us. And we're not conscious of those beliefs. We walk around with, you know, hundreds of beliefs that are programmed into us. And I help people get in touch with them, find the source so they can release them so that they can receive what they're conceiving, you know, and that's what it's really about. And that's what's really important to have a, another person outside of your own self-talk, like yourself, to be able to shine light on that. Shine light on that. Otherwise, you can't yep. see it. You're, yep. you're in talking to yourself. And in yeah. the alcoholic world, don't they call that stinking thinking or something like that? Yeah. Or making <laughs> up excuses yeah. and rationalizing and all that stuff. You need somebody else on the outside to go, hey, need yeah. some help here. 
<laughs> a lot of it is teaching people how to do that for themselves. I don't want people to give me their power. I want them to be able to walk mm -hmm. through life and be able to catch those beliefs and realize, oh, that's a false belief. And, you know, literally right. get rid of it on their own. Of course, I, I'd love to help people with that, but I teach them how to do that on their own as well. That's where I think meditation is important, where you can kind of, uh, I say, like, take the Etch-A-Sketch and shake it up. Yeah. Kind of start from a clean slate and get to a neutral place where you're not doing that cognitive thinking thing. Kind of oh, get into some cognitive other thinking place. thing. Yes. It's in <laughs> trouble. My breathwork teacher, that's what he used to tell me. Stop thinking. <laughs> oh, I know. I hear you. Yeah. And it is a meditative state where I help people get into the subconscious realms and the spiritual realms. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about reprogramming. It's also getting in touch with what your soul and your spirit is here to do. So, yeah, yeah, it's tough to reprogram if you don't know what's broken. Right. Got to kind of figure it out. And I don't mean broken like a bad thing, because, you know, they say everything happens for a reason. But uh, things happen, and sometimes you're just not aware of it. Like my little nut goody situation, I never realized that, uh, that I had abandonment issues, because I, I do still see that if there's situations like if my wife is going out of town for an event or something. There's a little piece of me that says, I don't want you to go. You know, there's that little little baby Brad kind of complaining <laughs> a little bit. I want you to suck it up and, you know, you can spend four or five days or a week by yourself for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't like, like I said, I don't like to do these too long. I like to be able to have it small enough where people can consume it all. But uh, down the road, if you want to do another one on a specific niche topic or something, or if you've got a new program or new book you're releasing we can do another one and other than that i'd like to close this one off and beam it up to the universe so people can find it but before we okay. do once again how do we get a hold of you if we want to uh, learn more from rice my website is www.roycemorales.com r-o-y-c-e-m-o-r-a-l-e-s just like that and all that information is right like there that. yep well, there wonderful. it is wonderful well, Royce, I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time and uh, be safe up there in the, in the mountains and I'll yes. be safe here in <laughs> Minneapolis and you have a wonderful time. I'll get this uh, processed and off to you real quick. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank this you. was fun. Peace. Peace. <laughs>